What's up, Bama Insider Nation? You are watching the Daily Bama Factor. My name is Trey Yannity. This morning, I am joined by managing editor Kyle Henderson. Today's show is going to be a little bit different. We've got a different style. We're going to be talking the three things we've learned. We got two questions and one prediction at the end. Let's get right into it, Kyle. Start with the three things we've learned. The first thing we've learned, Alabama has a whole lot of fresh faces coming into this football program. Five new assistants. That's Bill O'Brien. Doug Marone, Robert Gillespie, Jay Graham, Jay Valai, Todd Watson, Shaheem Carter, Will Lawling, and grad assistant Man Ray St. Armour. Kyle, you know, all of these names are, are brand new to the program. Two former NFL head coaches and some former college guys. Overall, what are your thoughts on this new staff? And who has the biggest shoes to fill? I think when we look to the the new coaches that have been added, right, you have five that are the new assistants. And I think the biggest shoes to fulfill is certainly Bill O'Brien taking over for Steve Sarkeesian from the schematic standpoint, right? I think the way that Steve Sarkeesian was able to orchestrate the offense during the 2020 season was really magnificent. And it seemed like he only got better towards the later part of the season. I think that people are going to have different opinions about Steve Sarkeesian just because that he left, right? So um, he left, so he isn't that good. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think that he's been one of Alabama's best offensive coordinators, probably the best OC since Lane Kiffin. I know people love Lane Kiffin. And I think Steve Sarkeesian did a great job continuing to evolve this Alabama offense, continuing to demonstrate that he can help these quarterbacks progress. And, um, I mean, look what he did with Mac Jones. I mean, a couple of seasons um, under Steve Sarkeesian and Mac Jones throwing for 4,500 yards and looking at a, you know, top 10 pick in the NFL draft. <laughs> a couple of years ago, there was people that were like, we don't want Mac Jones yeah. to start. And then he throws for uh, 4,500 yards and wins a natty uh, here at the University of Alabama. I-, I think from the recruiting perspective, I think big shoes to fulfill will be You know, anyone who's trying to replace Jeff Banks, Carl Scott, Charles Huff, those guys did a fantastic job on the recruiting front. So you kind of look at Robert Gillespie, the new running backs coach, uh, Jay Graham, uh, Jay Valai, guys who are, you know, going to be your um, recruiting ninjas, so to speak. And those guys are going to have tough shoes to fulfill. However, with that said, it's all about that Alabama factor. So you got Nick Saban, you got the program built, you got the new facilities, you got the strength and science center. So you have all these different elements. And honestly, I think that this virtual world really helps Alabama and really helps Nick Saban continue to stay at the forefront of recruiting. Nick Saban didn't even have to get on his helicopter, his private (laughs) jet. He just flexed with his rings and Alabama won on the field. They continue to send guys to the league. So I I think that these guys are certainly going to have shoes to fulfill in regards to recruiting. But I think the Bama factor is really the biggest selling point. And and along with Nick Saban, it's like uh, as long as Nick Saban's still, you know, kind of master in chief of uh, everything at Alabama, I think that things will continue to go smooth, not only on the field, but recruiting as well. Yeah, you know, just flex the hardware. I think that's uh, said very well there. That's all you got to do. <laughs> Number one recruiting tool. Uh, like Kyle said, guys, three, two, one style this morning. We're going to keep it simple. It's as simple as hitting that like button. Please uh, do so and subscribe. Be part of that 50,000 club. We're getting close. Uh, you know, Kyle, you said it. Recruiting is going to be the biggest hole to fill. And, and, you know, Steve Sarkeesian obviously was a mastermind with this offense. He did things that, uh, you know, really separated this offense as maybe one of the best of all time. But you got two head coaches coming in uh, and some other very talented coaches. For me, I'm going to say Jay Graham, just because I think Jeff Banks was that recruiter number one on this staff, or of the guys that have left at least, you know, maybe from the tight end perspective, not as much. The running backs, uh, you know, he has a very great knowledge of running backs and and how that room's going to work, even though he's not uh, going to be the running back coach. He'll help out X's and O's wise, but I think his recruiting efforts, Jay Graham, uh, is going to be the most important for this team. Which coaches do you think, I guess, have the most work to do here? Which position do you look at uh, of a new head coach coming in that's really going to have to get into town here? Obviously, you, you think about Bryce Young, uh, you know, some of these other players, maybe the defense. Who has the biggest, um, you know, the most work to do, I guess, when they get to town? 
Well, I think that's a good question. I mean, you look at any of the new five uh, assistant coaches here at the University of Alabama. I mean, we just talked about Bill O'Brien and kind of the offensive schematics. He's also the quarterback's coach. So really bringing those quarterbacks up to speed, I think that's a really important part of this overall offense, right? You have three quarterbacks eligibility-wise that are freshmen, Bryce Young, uh, Paul Tyson, and then Jalen Milrow, all those guys with really limited playing experience. So I think from the quarterback perspective, again, you you can go back to Bill O'Brien, I think with Robert Gillespie, look, he's a running backs coach at Alabama, right? You're working with Brian Robinson, Killen Robinson, um, you know, Jace McQuellen, Trey Sanders, who's looking to get healthy. You're talking about uh, Roy Dale Williams, Kyle Edwards, and then Kamar Wheaton. It's it's unbelievable. The running back room is is stacked. So Robert Gillespie, look, I know we talked about from the recruiting standpoint, but he's like a kid in a candy store with the running backs, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think... You know, uh, maybe Doug Marone, he's the guy that we didn't talk about taking over the Alabama offensive line. Th- this is a group that won the Joe Moore Award, the, the top offensive line in the entire country. So I-, I know he has a lot of head coaching experience. He's coached the offensive line um, at several different places. But you're going to have to figure out a way to get the best five offensive line linemen on the field. It's not going to be that difficult to do. But you are replacing Alex Otherwood, Landon Dickerson, uh, Deontay Brown. So when we go into spring football, there's several positions that we're watching and especially some of these younger freshmen to see how they get acclimated uh, during springtime. JC Latham, Tommy Brockemeyer, uh, who's going to step up at, at, at the guard position? Um, who's going to step up? Um, you know, how, are we going to see some sort of transformation from Chris Owens returning at the center position? So I think Doug Marone working with these guys and look, if you're an Alabama offensive lineman and you find out that Doug Marone is your now position coach, you got to be elated considering he knows what it takes to get you to that next level. Oh, certainly. You know, if you're a Brockermeyer or any of these offensive linemen, you got to be thinking, wow, this dude was a head coach, not just a position coach in the NFL last year. This dude was the head coach from the NFL team. He's coming to be part of the Bama staff. And you got to thank for O'Brien and Marone. The resources may even be a step up uh, from what they had in the NFL with everything <laughs> that they have here at Bama. Uh, but, you know, a lot of excellent names. I really thought... You know, all these names were, were grade A hires. If you're grading this this group of incoming head coaches, maybe just a simple letter grade, uh, what are you giving it? Personally, I'm giving it an A. I, I think they nailed it pretty much at every spot. There's really not much more you could have done. Uh, but, you know, there was some doubters out there with some of these coaches. What are you, uh, what are you giving them overall? I mean, it's hard to, to, to grade, to be, to be honest, because everything that Nick Saban seems to touch is greatness, right? So it's not like you could even say, B or A or whatever. But I think after this season, we'll be able to kind of figure out, you know, how this coaching staff did coming off a perfect season. So I'm going to wait in terms of grading. I I think a lot of people going back to Bill O'Brien again, they have different opinions, you know, and and I've talked about this several times before. They're like, Bill O'Brien's coming. Uh, He's going to ruin the program. He's going to make some bad trades. I'm like, look, he's not the GM. He's not the head coach. He's coaching the quarterbacks. And he's coaching, you know, the offense. So just rest assured, Nick Saban has done his due diligence to make sure that all these coaches are going to fit within the system. Um, Quick nugget. I think I pointed this out before, but I believe that Bill O'Brien and Doug Marone actually roommates right now in Tuscaloosa until their wives, until their wives move here. So (laughs) those guys go back like a ways and, uh, you know, they're they're certainly getting acclimated to Tuscaloosa (laughs) during this wintry time. It's like. 30 degrees out here uh, as we continue to push into spring football. Yeah, welcome to T-Town, guys. Get the (laughs) snow and everything else. That's awesome, though. Roommates. How about that? Just back to college for Doug and Bill O'Brien. They will be assistant coaches, but Nate Oates is going to be the head coach at Alabama for quite some time. This week, they inked him up through 2027. Uh, That, that, you know, base salary and talent fee will increase by $3.2 million each year. Alabama definitely likes what they have in, in head coach Nate Oates. Uh, you know, the results are there. We knew this hire was a good one right away. The recruiting has been sensational. Uh, just in the second season now, he's 17 and 5 overall, 12 and, mar- 12 and 1 in the SEC. Uh, the, you know, the, the tide are currently number eight in the polls. This team is on fire, and it doesn't look like it's going to slow down. I mean, the recruits are coming in, JD, JD Davidson coming in uh, next year, and, and some other four stars. Who else? You know, who knows who's added to that class as well. So things are looking great for this program and Nate Oates for a while. Greg Byrne decides to to ink him up through 2027. What's your initial reaction to this deal uh, as Alabama really makes things official with Nate Oates? Well, I think when you look at Nate Oates as a basketball coach, I mean, this is only his second season at Alabama, and what he's done has been pretty remarkable. I mean, I think Alabama, one thing that I've learned in living in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, is that fans really want the basketball team to do really, really well. 
And yes, Nick Saban has set the bar for every other sport, um, you know, at an incre- incredibly high level. I mean, almost impossible because football is great, right? Like, like they're, it's elite. They don't even lose game. They didn't even lose the game last year, right? <laughs> Number one in recruiting, everything goes right. But with that said, Alabama fans... Um, want Alabama basketball to be elite as well. Nate Oates has done a fantastic job. I, I can't believe it's only year two. I, I'm, I remember watching him at his press conference and I really liked what he had to say. He had a lot of um, kind of Sabanisms when he talked. He, he read all of Nick Saban's books and all the coaching philosophy. And the guy has been a grinder and he's done a great job really transforming this basketball team into a fun team to watch. They certainly have that blue collar mentality and they have a lot of depth. So I think Greg Byrne, number one, looks like a genius for going out to get Nate Oates, because when they hire Nate Oates, you're like, who is Nate yeah. Oates? Right. Um, but but I think overall, the transformation of this basketball program has been fantastic. The deal is solid. I mean, three point two million annually. He's certainly getting paid. And I think they're going to make some some noise into March. Look, this team is not perfect. I think this team um, has yet to hit their ceiling, though. With that said, I, I think there's a lot of moving parts within this team. And I love the depth. I love how they can move the basketball. And when they can shoot, there's no team in America that can beat this team. Honestly, I'm going to say that. If this team is hot, they will slice through anybody in college basketball. With that said, and I know we have it down here in our script, but what's their downfall? I think it's it's quite simply that. How many times have we seen this team, um, if they're not shooting lights out, they're going to have a hard time because their game is not inside whatsoever. They don't have a dominating inside presence. That's not part of their game. There's nothing bad with that. So um, it's going to come to how well these guys can shoot on the road. They've done a great job. Look, John Petty um, and the rest of the squad, Herb Jones, those guys are the leaders. They didn't come under Nate Oates, but they've still been able to lead this team from the leadership perspective. And then you kind of add on these different elements that Nate Oates has uh, mixed in, and they've done a fantastic job in the SEC. I never did I think that these guys would be 12-1. Uh, and one. I mean, they almost came back and beat Missouri. Yeah, I mean, and I mean they, that that game really- was. I mean, the the announcers were talking about the Alabama had lost that game with like. 10 minutes to go and I was like hold on because this team can score quickly and you know if Herb Jones is able to get to that bucket then that team you know potentially right now is 13 and 0 17 and 5 overall as we kind of look at the back stretch for Alabama um, games remaining Vandy Arkansas Mississippi State Auburn they're going to be favorites in all those games I know Auburn is kind of pesky because they got good guard play um, they got good coaching but overall I think Alabama is going to get through the rest of those four games in the SEC and uh, we'll see what happens in the SEC tournament but I but I love this team. I love watching them. I think in the past, it's kind of been sleepy watching Alabama basketball. It hasn't been that fun, right? Um, but Nate Oates has certainly resurrected the basketball team. So to see him get a contract extension, a lot of people were really asking for it. Greg Burns delivers and inks him through March 14th of 2027. Like and subscribe, guys. Uh, you know, but what what's not to love about this team? This is a very disciplined team. And I know what you guys are thinking. You know, who's this? 21-year-old kid talking about discipline, whatever else, a basketball team. But this team truly is. You can see it in these players. You, you talked about it. John Petty, Herb Jones. These guys weren't around, uh, or they weren't, you know, recruited by Nate Oates. But they bought into Nate Oates. They've completely bought into this system. And he hit it right on the nose. You know, when it comes to, to downfalls with this team, you could argue turnovers. You know, you could argue that they get a little bit too aggressive, you know, defensively if somebody drives the lane. But at the end of the day, it really is their shooting. If they're on... They're going to win the game. There's nobody in the country that can beat this team if they're hitting. If they're not, you know, they're susceptible to losing to Missouri, Oklahoma, whoever, uh, like they have. But, you know, once they get their bigs back and, and really get things turning here, I, I just don't see them losing. They play Vandy on Saturday, uh, like you're talking about, Arkansas, Mississippi State, Iron Bowl of basketball to close it out uh, this season in Tuscaloosa, where Alabama ended Auburn's undefeated season last year. Um I'll play devil's advocate here. Do you think this contract is coming a little bit too soon? It's just year two. And, you know, people uh, love to, you know, secure coaches like this that have had such early success. But do you think that a six year deal like this is maybe a little bit too soon? No, I don't. I, I think that, you know, Greg Byrne did the right thing. I mean, you, you see the success that he's having. You see the, the way that Nate Oates carries himself. Um, he's one of the younger coaches kind of in the mix. And I think that he's done a fantastic job, um, you know, and, and he's well deserving of it. Look, I, I'm all about if you do well, then good things come. And I'm glad to see that Greg Byrne has immediately gone to him with his contract extension is the right thing to do. Greg Byrne's taking care of his people and Nate Oates continuing to do a fantastic job on the hardwood. 
Greg Byrne is taking care of his coaches. Guys, take care of us. Kyle works so hard. The rest of this team works so hard. Subscribe, like, check out the rest of the website. So much content out right now. That's our first two of the three things we learned. The third thing, Jalen Hurts looks to be quarterback number one with the Philadelphia Eagles. Broke in last season. Carson Wentz is now gone. It's looking like, at the beginning of of training camp at least, Jalen Hurts is going to be in line to take over QB1 in Philly. Uh, you know, I think it could work. A lot of people are skeptical. His style is is a little bit different. It fits into the style of the changing quarterback in the NFL, but his size hurts a little bit. There's some factors that might make you skeptical, putting him at quarterback number one. Last season, he was 77 for 148. He had six touchdowns, four interceptions. You listed the Kyle here. I mean, you listed the question here, Kyle. I'll ask it to you. Is he a franchise quarterback? I think it's an interesting question when you look at Jalen Hurts. I mean, I I think when you kind of look back at the career of Jalen Hurts, even when he started out at Alabama, I mean, this guy has been doubted every single day by every single body, right? There's even Alabama fans that continue to doubt him. Um, And and I get it. People love Jalen Hurts. I love Jalen Hurts. The way that he carried himself, like the stoic personality that he had was fantastic just to to be around because the guy had the wisdom of like a 75-year-old man, right? I mean, he never said anything wrong. He was all about business. When Tua Tunga Wailoa came and took his spot, he handled that like a grown man and he came back and he won the SEC championship game for Alabama against Georgia in one of like, that was like some type of movie that we were watching in real life, right? The way that he was able to demonstrate. So he won at Alabama. Then he goes to Oklahoma. He wins at Oklahoma. We all know that Oklahoma is not going to win a national championship. Come on. But but the point is he was able to go there and win. People doubted him that, you know, he wasn't going to be a quarterback that was able to be successful in the NFL. Was he overly successful in the NFL? I mean, that's debatable. I mean, the Eagles just traded Carson Wentz or or at least you know released him which is mind-blowing because look I follow the 49ers um we got Jimmy Garoppolo we got quarterback problems I would love for Carson Wentz to to go out to Santa Clara to to be the 49ers quarterback so uh, this is a big movement by the Philadelphia Eagles kind of putting their um hopes into Jalen Hurts I think that Jalen Hurts can continue to be successful is he a franchise quarterback? I think that's another thing that we're going to have to circle back on. I would probably say no right now, but I'm not going to doubt Jalen Hurts going into year two. Um, 77 of 148, six touchdowns and four interceptions. Look, I'm going to ask you this, Trey, and, and I'm going to ask you everybody else that, that's watching this, that's listening to this. I mean, who is a better quarterback in 2020, Jalen Hurts or Tua Tonga Valoa? That's a hard <laughs> one, and that's loaded, Kyle. That's a, uh, you know, that, that's a tough one. But that could, that could start a war. It, it really could. It really could. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a fair question. And, and the thing about Jalen Hurts versus a guy like maybe Tua, uh, with the way he's played, with the way things have kind of shaken out, where he was drafted, he might not have to ask for a ton of money. You know, when it is time to get re-signed somewhere, if it is Philly, so his situation is really pretty favorable for a quarterback. And if nothing else, you know, maybe he ends up somewhere else if it's not Philadelphia to start this season. Uh, but Tua Tugvalo would probably tell you it was him that year. And he's he's looking <laughs> to get better as well. We don't have it on here. Let's talk Tua for just a second. There's so many crazy headlines surrounding the NFL. Deshaun Watson may be heading to Miami. Tua may be exiting, you know, or maybe not at all. What do you see happening, you know, with consideration of this year's draft as well with Tua Tugvalo in 2021? I think that's a good question to talk about Tua. And, um, you know, I was just, you know, kind of uh, starting some sort of debate between Jalen and Tua. Never, <laughs> I never get tired of it. Oh, it's awesome. Um, I love Tua. And, and the way that he carried himself and, and the career that he had at Alabama, I know it was cut short by injury. I still remember at Mississippi State how devastating that was for everybody in the country to watch that and to see his transformation, to see his recovery um, was, was really great. I, I think that. Um, him going to the Dolphins and him inking that $35 million contract was so well-deserved. I mean, the guy completely uh, deserved everything that comes his way. I, I think when you look long-term with, with uh, Tua Tonga Valoa, I, 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 his ceiling is so high, and we barely got a taste of, of him just recently. But I think overall, you kind of look at his statistics from this past season. Um, you know, they, they weren't the best, but he still threw for 1,800 yards, 11 touchdowns, and five interceptions. There was a couple games where he certainly got the Miami Dolphins rolling, right? Like, there was a time where you, you were like, whoa, you know? Yeah, oh yeah. As soon as they kind of swapped him in, and I know he, they kind of went back and forth throughout the remainder of the season, 
But there for a while, what did the Dolphins win like four games or something like that? Yeah, they that? were on a little streak. They went on a little streak under yeah. Tua. And uh, so, so I think long term, Tua is going to be just fine. I think, you know, once he gets, and I don't, I'm sure he was 100% healthy or, or 90%, whatever yeah. it is. But I think as he gets more acclimated with the NFL, uh, he's going to be just fine. I mean, the guy can still throw the football and put it on the money like nobody's business. I mean, what he did here at Alabama connecting with, I, I know, you got Jerry Judy, you got Henry Ruggs, you got Jalen Waddell, you got Devontae Smith. <laughs> but he threw the he threw the football up in the air. And he, the touch that he had, I mean, the the, the football had wings of an angel on different. it. It was different. You could just see it. You could just see it. I mean, look, Mac Jones balled out. I love Mac Jones as well, the joker. But what Tua Tungvaloa did, when he would release the ball, it was a thing of beauty every single time. It's insane. It was almost <laughs> like your eyes just turned to cameras. They just focused right on the ball, and it just it found its way to the receiver. Uh, you know, there's, there's no overstating the kind of career he had here and really what it could have been if he had remained healthy the entire time. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if you remember back to that press conference that day that he announced he was going to the NFL – uh, you know, he was just so torn up about it. He was so sad. And there was reports afterwards that he maybe that morning even had to go back and forth on the decision. So, you know, such a great guy. Hope that the opportunity is there for him this year. I think it will be. If it's not in Miami, it will be somewhere. Uh, just so elusive. And, you know, he needs to get his style of play as well. That's our three uh, things that we've learned. On to the two questions. This one's going to be a little bit of a shorter segment. Asking two questions, two pretty important questions. This one these two are both focused around Alabama football. The first one is Bryce Young, the man for the job at quarterback. He was 13 for 22, 156 yards and a touchdown in 2020. Probably could have, you know, had better stats if he had played longer, if, you know, the receiver doesn't drop the TD, everything else. But there are still many doubters, not haters, just doubters on Bryce Young. I'm I'm still in that boat, but I'm I'm pretty sold. This kid is legit. He he was a five star. He has all the tools. We saw it. We saw it in a very raw form last year. He, he's definitely going to have to make improvements, get bigger, tune things up. But um, you know, I don't see why not Bryce Young. This this kid was the number one recruit in the country. Yeah, when you talk about Bryce Young and some of the production that. Uh, we saw from him last year. You're like, where is the production, right? He was only 13 and 22 for 156 yards uh, during his inaugural season with the Alabama Crimson Tide. Nick Saban has said it plenty of times. I think the SEC only schedule had a lot to do with why some of these freshmen didn't play, especially in the offensive side of the ball. We all saw freshmen emerge on the defensive side of the ball. Look what Malachi Moore did. Look what William Anderson did. Look what even Tim Smith did, right, on the defensive side. But the offense, I think they were so rhythmic that Mac Jones had – um, something very, very special going. And look, it's kind of, I, I know Texas and Steve Sarkeesian has taken this to uh, Austin, all gas, no brakes. Uh, <laughs> but look, Alabama is all ba- all gas, no brakes, right? I mean, that, they're, they're doing that on every single game. So there wasn't a lot of opportunities for Bryce to come in. I kind of revert back to two games when I look at uh, Bryce Young. The first is against Tennessee. I think he did a lot of things well. He could have thrown a touchdown pass. It was dropped by Slade Bolden in the end zone. Um, saw uh, somewhat of a good sample size there. And then I look back at that Kentucky game where you shot, where you saw that shiftiness. He was able to evade a defender, look downfield, throw it to Devontae Smith, who um, caught it for a touchdown. So I think going into this season, from, from what I gather, they want um, Bryce Young to play at 205 pounds. I'm not sure what, what he was at this past season, maybe 185 pounds. So you, you add that weight to him. You kind of put on some muscle, and I'm sure that David Ballou and Dr. Matt Ray have a good game plan for him going into uh, the 2021 season. But look, this is your guy, and and, and no disrespect for to Paul Tyson or Jalen Milrow, I think those guys are going to get opportunities as well. Look, they're going to have an ability to showcase their their overall ability during the springtime. But from what I gather, talking to people close to the program, Bryce Young is QB one going into the springtime. There's no official depth chart necessarily set until uh, a couple days out before Alabama's first game of the season. That's when Nick Saban literally distributes a depth chart. Uh, But look, you're going to have Bryce Young taking the first team reps, working with the guys, and I'm excited to see him. I'm excited to see what he can do when he doesn't have that I don't even know if it was pressure, but look, the guy would come in, there would be like two minutes left in the game, five minutes left in the game, and I felt like he was always trying to you know, make a big play. Play rushed, now he can come in and he's like, look, this is my team. This is my offense. What can I do? And, and I think you're going to see that Bryce Young that we saw at the high school level. This, this was a guy who was a magician, who was a playmaker, who could extend plays, who could put the ball where it needed to be. Um, he has that ability to uh, make 
defenders miss. He has an ability to put the football right where it needs to be. And I think going into the season, you're going to continue to see a high level of efficiency from Alabama's quarterback in Bryce Young. He was just trying to play nervous, maybe is the word even. He, he just... He was trying to be cute with it. He was trying to be perfect. And at times, um, you know, it was a little bit of his downfall this past season. But I'm right there with you. I think he comes out. He gains the weight. He, he you know, works on his skills with a former NFL head coach now and, and gets right for this for this 2021 season. And he's going to have a solid core still. People want to talk about this wide receiving core. You know, you're losing Devontae Smith. You're losing Jalen Waddell, obviously. Yeah. But you're bringing back some excellent receivers. Uh, and I kind of this is going to lead into our, our question number two here. Who's your breakout player in 2021? I'll get us started with this one. Javon Baker offensively for me. Uh, we, we had him in our player spotlight a few days ago. Just looking into him a little bit more. This kid is so talented. The route running abilities are, are unbelievable the way he creates space. It's a lot like Jerry Judy almost. Maybe a little bit of a bigger Jerry Judy. Uh, his high point abilities are insane. This dude has strong hands. There's just a lot to like about Javon Baker. Didn't really get his chance in his freshman season. Uh, you know, obviously with the way that core was, but um, he's going to have ample opportunity in 2021. And I think he goes crazy this year. Offensively, who is your breakout player? You saw it on uh, social media. He, he kind of used some of our voiceover. It was uh, Jalil Billingsley. Yeah. Look, that's all good. If you're a player out there and you see some of our stuff and you want to take the audio, feel free. If you want us to do some voiceovers for you, hit us up. Family please, Insider. Please. Um, Billingsley <laughs> is, is a guy that I think can create mismatches. I can't wait to see as he becomes more transformed as a player because he can create mismatches being that he's half wide receiver, he's half tight end. You get him to the outside. You get him in different situations. I think he's the player that we all felt that. Uh, remember Terrell Shavers before he transferred out to oh, Mississippi yeah, State? Terrell I think he, my guy. Yeah, he, I think he transferred out to San Diego he, State, right? He did. Yeah, 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 he transferred again, and then yeah. I, I think there's other he, stuff He's on the West Coast. Now, he'll, yeah. he'll be fine. <laughs> he'll be fine eventually. But I, Billingsley is kind of, you know, he has that height. I think he's like six foot five, and um, he has a speed. He runs great routes. So, we, we, we definitely saw a good sample size of him last year, and I loved how Steve Sarkeesian was able to use him in different scenarios, um, hit him out on, on a screen, um, different situations to get him the football because he's that dynamic. So when you talk breakout players, I know he, he kind of had a, a mini breakout season, but I think coming back this year, especially with Alabama really having just John Mechie as kind of that, that staple wide receiver, we're, we're, we're still trying to figure out who additionally could be these other wide receivers stand out. There's, of course, going to be many, but Billingsley is a guy that I certainly have my eyes on. Um, on the defensive side, I look to uh, Tim Smith. The guy's a, a, a beast, yeah. and Alabama certainly needs a guy from the defensive line to provide that interior pass rush. So look for Tim Smith to have a big year um, in year two. Keep an eye on, and he's been around the program for a long time, Fedarian Mathis. Fedarian Mathis is a guy that I've always appreciated his game, um, he, I think he's played in like over 40 games for Alabama, yeah. 76 total tackles. It's really hard to keep off the field. A guy who stays healthy, which you can't say for a lot of these players because it's a gauntlet of a season, right? You're going against the best every single day. But Federian Mathis, don't sleep on him. I, I think he's not going to have this huge breakout year, I don't think. But in terms of guys who might be a little bit overshadowed but are doing work in the trenches, please do not forget about Federian Mathis. Yeah, Fideri Mathis really has never gotten the credit. That defensive line, um, both lines, don't get the credit they deserve. Give them some love, guys. I like it. Phil Mathis, uh, defensively, I'm going to go DeMarco Hellams. This, you know, this is a player that has had some opportunity but really hasn't had you know, ample opportunity. This season, he's going to get it. And this secondary is going to be pretty, pretty good now, I think. A lot of people had their doubts last year outside of Patrick Sertain. Uh, but, but they're going to get loaded up, and I think uh, DeMarco Hellams could be a big part of that. That's who I got on defense. Those are our two questions. Guys, hit the like button. Subscribe. Can't hit that like button enough. Uh, we got one prediction left. We had three things we've learned, two questions leading up to this one prediction. Kyle, I'll, I'll let you get us started here. What is your one prediction for the rest of this spring? <laughs> it's easy. Alabama will figure out how to play their spring football game. I know it, it's scheduled for April 17th. And the biggest question I get, believe it or not, on email or on Twitter or whatever, on, on our message boards, there's no way Alabama is going to be able to have their spring football game. I'm like, okay, Alabama just played 13 games. Their last few games were, <laughs> you know, in different parts of the country. I think Alabama is going to be able to navigate uh, a, a way to have a day. They're going to they're gonna do it safe. Th this was a program who tested their players every single day when COVID-19 was at its highest point. 
And they did a great job making sure that the student athletes, uh, you know, that the fans uh, were in limited capacity at the stadium. So I think overall they'll have a great game plan to execute a day and spring football. And, and look, I'm still surprised that Alabama was able to go perfect in 2020 because they didn't even have a spring season. So that could be another reason why some yeah. of these other freshmen didn't get on the field. They didn't have that critical part. I mean, I still remember back to 2020, Alabama was about to start spring football and then everything just got shut down. And then there was no spring football. And I, I think, you know, it, it probably had a little bit of, of a, an effect against Missouri. But man, the way that Alabama was to you know, able to really start and end the season, it still blows my mind because I, I feel, in my opinion, that spring football plays a pivotal role in the development of the continuity, the team identity going into each season. So for them not to have a spring game last year and them still to go undefeated, um, really a testament to the kind of the coaching and to that Bama factor and to the overall philosophy of Nick Saban. It's insane to think about. Nobody should have gone undefeated in 2020. It just with the way everything was, no spring football, uh, the dates, everything else, just getting messed up and strictly SEC play. Nobody needed to go uh, undefeated in 2020. Alabama decided they'd uh, they'd do it and they won the national title. Um, my, my one prediction: I'm going to say Nick Saban has no milk cream pie this morning for breakfast. No, uh, I'm going to I'm going to say Alabama goes undefeated the rest of SEC play. I, I think this in basketball that is. I, I think that this schedule is favorable. You got Vandy, Arkansas, Mississippi State, and Auburn teams that they've uh, they've already beat three of them, and Vandy's the worst of of the four. So, uh, you know, I, I think they run the table the rest of the way, and I think they win the conference in the regular season, maybe that conference uh, tournament as well. Kyle, your final thoughts uh, this Friday morning as we as we get here to wrap up. Well, two things to note. I know we just dropped um, some news on Ali Kaho entering the NCAA transfer portal. Uh, we just did a video of player spotlight <laughs> a couple days before. Um, but Kaho certainly uh, a guy that I feel that has a lot of ability. And I think wherever he ends up, he's going to make an impact. I, I felt that, you know, overall, just kind of watching him. He was a guy that just was never able to crack that first team. But, you know, all the respect to these guys who are trying to, you know, figure it out as, as they navigate through their college season. Also, Alabama Snate Oates named to the Naismith Men's Coach of the Year late season watch list. Um, we'll have a press conference with him um, at 12 o'clock on Friday to also talk about um, him and him earning some new uh, cheddar from the new contract extension from Greg Burns. So it never stops on Bam Insider. If you want news to happen, go do something. Go have lunch and news will break. But we got you covered always back here at BamInsider.com. Always got you covered. Big week for Nate Oates, man. He's, he's got the bag now. He's got uh, he's on the watch list. He's having a really great week. Uh, like Kyle said, guys, so much content out right now. Hit up BamaInsider.com. Continue to check out that YouTube page, our social media as well. Uh, what do we have coming up this next week as far as shows and stuff? I know we got Monday Night Quarterback going on next week. We got our recruiting shows. Uh, Mick Gillespie will get on and do his call-in show as well. Big week for Alabama, as it always is. Baseball opens up this weekend as well. We got gymnastics at home. All kinds of stuff going on. For Kyle Henderson, my name is Trey Yannity. Hit that like button one more time before we get out of here. Subscribe. Thank you guys for being with us this morning. We'll catch you next week. Roll Tide.